Hello. Okay. Will I start now? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak at your, your cannabis, um, Nordic Cannabis Summit. Um, I was really delighted to get the invitation, and I'm very sorry I can't join you in person uh, because I really do love um, the Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries in general. Um, but I'm delighted that Emmet was able to travel uh, to be with you today. So we're going to split the presentation. I'll go for the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and then Emmet will take over. Um, and I think in view of the... Um, this kind of difficulties logging in. I think Emmett may may be able to deal with the questions. So um, I'll I'll sign off at the end of my piece. Anyway, um, so I I just want a little bit my, my own background and why I'm why I'm interested in this area. I actually come from the background of psychosis. So I was I have always been very interested in early risk factors for um, psychotic disorders in adulthood. And I just I was lucky enough to get to work with the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study, which is a one of the the most renowned uh, birth cohort studies in the world. Um, and I was looking at early risk factors for schizophrenia, prim primarily childhood developmental risk factors. And we also um, a group of us, Richie Poulton and uh, some of us, were, were also interested in the psychotic-like experiences that young people were, were reporting at age 11. And it was very exciting when we found that these appeared to be a strong risk factor for later schizophrenia or schizophreniform disorder with odds ratios of, of uh, 16-fold um, for the stronger symptoms. I suppose I'm not talking about psychosis today, but the, the reason that this was interesting was because... Um, this study had come out in 1987 and um, Andreasen and Alebeck's study on uh, the Swedish conscript study, as it's called. And I know you have uh, Peter Alebeck is, is speaking um, after, after us on the programme, which is a, it'll going to be a great honour to hear him. This is one of the classic studies in psychiatric epidemiology. And it was the first study to point out this uh, relationship between, between psychosis and uh, later, sorry, between early cannabis use and later psychosis. And you can see this um, really classic um, uh, dose response relationship between the amount of uh, cannabis that the conscripts had smoked and their risk of a schizophrenia diagnosis later on. And I'm sure Peter will be going into more detail on this, but this study um, was there in the background and uh, even though it was it was incredibly well designed and um you know i i would consider almost faultless in his in his methodology people were always querying well you know you don't know whether the cannabis the the, the cannabis use came first you know perhaps these young people were already experiencing psychosis and that's why they were using cannabis in order to self-medicate so the the um Dunedin study allowed us to look at that because we had this information on these psychotic experiences already at age 11. And Louise, uh, it was Professor Robin Murray's idea um, to, to link up with Louise Arsenault, who did the analysis looking at um, cannabis use and later schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder in the Dunedin core, showing a fourfold increased risk if young people use before the age of 15. And what was really interesting is when Louise adjusted for prior psychotic experiences, this risk dropped a little, but it was still a threefold increased risk, thus showing that actually the cannabis use uh, preceded the uh, psychosis and not the other way around. Um, oh, the, sorry, this is it in, in uh, so when you, this is before, the, the pink is before adjustment for psychotic symptoms and the ochre color bar is after adjustment for psychotic symptoms. And what's also interesting here is, um, and Louise was the first person to report this, is that the earlier the use, the higher the risk of, of uh, psychotic disorders later on. So users by 18 uh, did not appear to have the um, high odds, odds of developing psychotic disorder as the, one, the ones who started using by age 15. Now, what was interesting as well is we did find that users, uh, people who started using by age 18 were at higher risk of depression. But um, at the time, uh, I suppose I wasn't interested in depression. It's funny how in hindsight you, 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 you develop an interest in these, these things. So we'll come back to the depression link. Um, what was the other thing is that, that you know, people say it's a rare um, outcome of early cannabis use. But in fact, in the Dunedin study, um, of those young people who were using by age 15, now there were only uh, a small number, less than 20 of them, 10% of them later developed schizophreniform disorder. Now this, by any reckoning, is not an insignificant um, proportion. And so the evidence mounted um, from, you know, from Andreasen's classics and Alebeck's classic study, um, to, uh, it kept, kept, the evidence kept coming about this link, showing odds ratios of between three uh, and four for later uh, uh, schizophrenia and schizophreniform disorder. Uh, 
I also um, have found an interesting association between cannabis use and uh, early childhood trauma in increasing risk for psychotic symptoms in young people, showing that there is a kind of a synergistic effect between the two. So, um, you know, we all know that childhood trauma leads to a range of um, problems in later life, mental health problems, and so does cannabis, but the two acting together can be particularly powerful combination, if you like. Now, the, I suppose I, I, I left the, the cannabis, um, I was, didn't do much work in cannabis for a number of years, and then the studies started coming through from Robin Murray's group and Marta D. Forty's group, and I'm sure Peter will be talking about these again, and, and Bertha Mart Madras mentioned them, showing these very high um, incidence rates of schizophrenia in three cities um, in Europe, London, Amsterdam, and Paris. And this seemed to indicate that um, when they looked at it, they could find a relationship between the rate of cannabis use in these um, cities and the rate of psychosis. And particularly when they looked at the interview data, they found a very high risk, of, up to a ninefold risk in um, Amsterdam in particular for frequent use of high potency cannabis. So this, this um, showed that you could prevent up to 50% of the psychosis in Amsterdam if people had not used this high potency cannabis. And in fact, uh, Marete Nordentoft's group in, um, in, in Copenhagen have been looking at the population of refraction and showing that it's increasing over time, which I suppose you would expect with the increase in potency. Because what's interesting is when, when we were doing this work in Dunedin and, and even the, the Swedish conscript study, this was low potency cannabis and we were still finding these effects. So, um, you know, the, the effects are getting higher association. So, and as um, Bertha pointed out, um, this heavy cannabis use is now one of the highest, sorry, sorry, one of the high, <laughs> highest um, risk factors for schizophrenia. Okay, moving on to one of the great myths of our time is that countries that legalize cannabis use see reduced or do not see an increase in youth use. This is one of my bugbears, and this is a nice uh, um, table I found in uh, the SAMHSA's um, report uh, from 2017, and they have they have listed young people, it's listed states, the U.S. states, in terms of their percentage of young people using uh, cannabis, and um, what they in in the past month, and they also quite cleverly color coded the states in terms of uh, whether they were um, they had legalized cannabis for medical use which are the green states or for um, recreational use which is the red states and you can see i mean you don't you don't need to be a genius to see that the states with the, uh, the either the recreational or medical marijuana legalization have the highest rates of youth use um, but nevertheless, studies are still appearing in the literature saying that there is no increase in youth use uh, post-legalization. Um, uh, and a study by uh, this Mark Anderson, who's, who's from Department of Agricultural Economics um, in um, one of the U.S. universities, um, he's quite prolific in this regard, and he keeps... Um, submitting research letters showing that uh, there is no increase in youth use. However, the data he uses does, does leave out several of the larger states that were first to legalize. And also, as we have discussed uh, numerous times here, you know, it, states that have had medical marijuana use for many years have already a high rate of use. And you're, you're not going to find much, much of a difference when you go to um, legalized for recreational use. Um, now, uh, Madalena Kerda um, from the National, uh, used the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, and she studied, she managed to study all the, the states that had, the major states that had legalized to that point, and did find an increase in cannabis use disorder of 25% in 12 to 17 year olds post, uh, post legalization for um, uh, recreational use. However, what's very interesting is that in her discussion, she says that her study's findings suggest that although marijuana legalization advanced social justice goals, the small post-recreational marijuana legalization increase in risk for respondents um, are, and the increased frequent use and cannabis use disorder among adults 26 years or older in this study are a potential public health concern. Um, what I'm concerned about is I, I didn't quite, I looked through the paper numerous times to find where the evidence was that marijuana legalization has advanced social justice goals. I was curious as to why that had, had appeared in her in her discussion and in her findings. Um, and there was really no evidence presented that this was the case. It seems to be um, 
you know, just, just something people say uh, without having to provide evidence. And in fact, if you look, the evidence tends to go the opposite direction. Um, you know, there's just as many illegal marijuana grows. In fact, the, the illegal marijuana uh, industry has increased as far as I can make out in, in certain states in the US. And, you know, racial disparities and arrests persist even in states that have legalized um, uh, uh, marijuana. And this is even from this is from the cannabis industry itself presenting this finding. Um, drug overdose deaths, as we heard, um, very sadly, have continued to increase post post legalization, and the economic costs of cannabis legalization, which were meant to be a bonanza for the economy, in fact, has this is not um, this has not materialized. Um, I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot about this tomorrow. And in fact, it's it's thought that in fact states are spending more um you know for every dollar gain they have to spend about four times as much in the costs of of the um harms uh, secondary to cannabis use this um i think bertha madras presented a version of this this um, uh, um map which i and, and i got this slide from bobby smith who will be presenting tomorrow showing you know cannabis use disorder attributable to drug use in 10 to 24 year olds worldwide and the red state the red states are those with the higher levels and blue of the lower levels um so you can again you don't need to be genius to see um that canada and the us are leading the world in this uh, in rates of cannabis use disorder and you know, as, as as Bobby Smith has often pointed out, why are we looking to them as an example for you know how to um, how to deal with with drug use problems? Um, so this uh, the other issue is, of course, potency is increasing. We heard a lot about that uh, this morning, um, and this this is particularly concerning uh, because the side effects of THC are associated with many mental health side effects, including psychosis, as we heard, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, dependence, and cognitive impairment, which Amit will be talking to us about. Um, cannabis is a gateway drug for young people, um, despite what those in, in the, the, the pro-cannabis uh, legalization um, proponents would say is, is there is evidence now from twin studies that um, there is higher rates of uh, progression to other drug use in the twin who uses um, marijuana early and um, and of course twin studies are a classic example of keeping all other factors constant while you can look at one one risk factor in particular there's a lot of evidence for poor outcomes post cannabis use. Um, this is one of the classic papers again by Ferguson and Bowden, um, showing a range of poor outcomes in young people who use cannabis early in life. And of course, this is uh, the other concerning thing about cannabis. This is a drug of youth, and this is exactly you know from 18 to 25 is not only the period where your brain is developing, but it's also where you're developing your social networks, you're finishing your education, you're starting on your career trajectory, you're developing, uh, you're, you're, you know, finding your your life partner. Um, so this is so anything that interferes with these uh, key milestones will have a lasting effect on your outcomes in later life. Now, a lot of, another argument is that. Um, that the uh, a lot of these effects would be due to comorbid alcohol use and people say um, you know many of the arguments that, that we hear when people talk about uh, the effects of cannabis are well alcohol is just as bad um, and i mean i am not here to uh, to 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 promote alcohol use in any way and you know it, it's ironic that you know we are we're um you can point to one of the other great public health hazards and say, well, just because alcohol is doing all this, we should legalize cannabis, um, which will do just the same things. And in fact, looking at this study, again, by Magdalena Kurda and um, Madeleine Mayer, um, showed that even when you adjust for uh, uh, cannabis for alcohol use, comorbid alcohol use, cannabis it does appear still to have quite severe effects on um, economic and social outcomes. In fact, in some cases, even worse than, um, than the alcohol dependence. This is an uh, interesting study by uh, Edmund Sillens um, from in Lancet in 2014, showing again what I was talking about, which is the the range of poor outcomes in young people who use cannabis. So you can see that you know high school completion decreases. This is the the, the greater the use the uh, use of cannabis, the lower the risk of completing high school. Um, the, the increase in other illicit drugs, increase in suicide attempts, increase in depression. Um, so this, this is 
you know, it's an a very interesting paper um, looking at this range of outcomes and the increased risk of being on social welfare payments. So I think I've mentioned these, range of poor outcomes. I think we always need to emphasize this. Um, and all of these, um, of course, have an effect on mental health also. So this is a really classic, uh, again, a very um, well done um, systematic review by Gabriella Gobby, who's a, a Canadian researcher, um, looking at the association of cannabis use in adolescence and the risk of depression, anxiety, and suicidality in young adulthood. And she, they, her, she and her team looked through about 5,000 papers, they screened 3,000 papers for the title and abstract, they included 265 full text articles. And then they um, used 35 uh, studies for the qualitative synthesis and 11 for the quantitative synthesis. So this is what Bertha Madras was talking about is the power of the, of the ability to synthesize the literature now. You're not talking about just one study, you're talking about groups of studies. Um, so systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and now we're coming on to mega-analyses, which are actually reviews of systematic reviews. So there's, there's a huge amount of evidence. But what Gabriella Gavi's group found um, was, you know, if you look at this as a, uh, the classic forest plot for systematic reviews, and I think Emmett will be showing you his, his work um, just after this, which anything to the right of the line would be favoring cannabis use. And the, if the line, if the conference interview does not cross that middle line, it's, it's a significant effect. So, and right down at the end, so you can see all the way down, all the studies are showing an increase in depression in young people who have used cannabis in adolescence. And down at the end here and here, sorry, this is increase in anxiety. And then the diamonds are the, uh, the pooled effect and you can see here for depression, the pooled effect for all these studies does not cross the midline. So there's a, a significant increase in depression in young people who use cannabis in adolescence. The, the diamond shape for anxiety does cross the midline. So there is not a significant effect in this, even though this, the findings do seem to indicate a trend towards increase in anxiety. This is very concerning. These are the, the results for suicidal ideation and for suicide attempts. You can see again, um, the studies are on the right-hand side of that, the midline, showing a uh, positive effect of cannabis use in adolescence on suicide ideation, which is thinking about suicide, and even more worrying on suicide attempts. So you can see here that this diamond shape um, is not crossing the midline for either of these, but particularly for the suicide attempts, you have a threefold increased risk, more than a threefold increased risk, 300% increased risk of uh, suicide attempts for young people who use um, uh, cannabis. And again, in, in our country, and I'm sure in many of you, there's a lot, lot of concern about suicide in young people. And it, it does seem um, contradictory that we are so concerned and trying to reduce suicide rates in young people, and yet we are becoming quite lax about cannabis, which is, is a major risk factor for suicide attempts. And we, um, Mary Clark from my group, um, we published a paper in, in World Psychiatry, a research letter showing a sevenfold increased risk in suicide attempts among a, young, a group of young people who had used cannabis in, in um, adolescence compared to those who did not. And this rate was, um, uh, you know, the, the cannabis use and pre-morbid and pre-existing depression and anxiety were the, the made and uh, were the major risk factors for suicide attempts in our cohort study. This is, shows that for young people with depression or other mood disorders, cannabis use is particularly harmful and associated with high, high rates of uh, self-harm, suicide, all-cause mortality, um, overdose, motor vehicle deaths, and again, you'll be hearing about that later this afternoon, and homicide. And this is the other thing we don't talk about much, is um, the association between cannabis use and violence. Louise Arsenault published a paper many years ago showing that uh, early cannabis use is one of the uh, risk factors for violent behavior in, in the Dunedin birth cohort study. And here we have it again, a um, six-fold, well, a three-fold increased risk once it's adjusted of homicide in young people who um, use cannabis. This is the um, Surgeon General, uh, previous Surgeon General in the US, Jerome Adams. Uh, he was, he was um, President Trump's um, Surgeon General, but he had he was very, very concerned 
about cannabis. Um, and he had a, an, uh, issued an advisory with very hard hitting statements that no amount of cannabis is safe for the developing brain. Um, now he's not he's not the Surgeon General at the moment, but it was it was interesting that he felt this was a priority area that he needed to target. Uh, it's pre-pandemic, obviously. Um, Professor Robin Murray has been a major um, uh, person to speak out about cannabis use, particularly the risk of psychosis, but also now extending into the risks for other other disorders, as we've seen, um, such as depression. And he's particularly concerned what's happening in the US and Canada. And uh, his paper with um, Marco Calisi stated that the USA and Canada have embarked on a major pharmaceutical experiment with the brains of their youth, and we should wait and see the outcome of the experiment. Um, so where do, I suppose, the, the, you know, we had a really interesting talk, uh, two talks this morning um, uh, from um, Bertha Madras and uh, your previous speaker, Benningson. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. <laughs> um, Yes, and he about the, the the myths, the fact that cannabis has managed to uh, position itself as a very safe and um, as something to be, um, uh, you know, something that we should be that should be freely available. Um, and where do these myths come from? And I think in order to do this, and again, I was alerted to this the literature by by Bobby Smith, who will be speaking to you tomorrow, uh, work by David Michaels, who's been looking at the tobacco industry. And I think we need to look very carefully at how tobacco got such a foothold into uh, the public uh, uh, public health, if you like, and how it, it managed to flourish, despite all the, the evidence that was um, for, for very serious outcomes. And one of the, one of the tricks was um, using the medical profession. Um, so their scientific advisory boards um, were, were handpicked for skeptics um, about uh, the literature on cannabis, uh, sorry, on tobacco and lung cancer. And even better, they said they were always looking for skeptics who smoked uh, to be on these, these advisory boards. Um, we, the, one of the features is that um, we need to be seen, the medical profession particularly, um, need to be seen to speak with one voice on these things. And if you introduce any element of doubt, as we've seen, so as, as the previous slide showed, the, you know, doubt is their product, so you need to induce doubt. Um, and so some some doctors have, have been, um, you know, in, in, inducing this, this element of doubt. This is a very, uh, a feature by um, Barnes, who wrote the case for medical cannabis, and then but later um, made quite a lot of money from legalizing um, from his uh, deal with the uh, recreational marijuana firm. Um, this is, I, I may skip this. This is, a, Bobby may, might deal with this in his talk tomorrow. It's just a, a story of head shops in Ireland and how they, they got a foothold. These were the novel psychoactive substances. Uh, they got a foothold in Ireland in about 2008, 2009, caused a huge amount of um, uh, problems with not just with with death um, which was very serious but also with increasing numbers of admissions to psychiatric hospitals in Ireland with young people who've been using these uh, very potent substances a lot of these were synthetic can cannabinoids um, and what happened what happened was and I suppose it's, it's a you know maybe we should be talking about solutions as well is uh, the power of parents was harnessed to um, picket these shops to to lobby their local politicians and say we do not want these shops open um, and it was incredibly powerful the government introduced legislation the shops were closed down you can see the black the black line here and the rates of psychiatric hospitalizations also fell so this was an example of a um, positive public health, uh, the power of legislation and the power of um, parents, if you like, and the power of lobbying. I think, you know, the medical profession, we need to be very uh, active and very vocal about this. We have the evidence now, as we're, we're going to be seeing today and over tomorrow, we have the evidence. We need to know how to use it now. Um, my feeling is that, that, you know, psychiatry in particular, psychology, we need to be thinking about cannabis in the same way that the respiratory physicians think about tobacco or the liver uh, physicians or cardiologists think about alcohol. This is our major toxin. Um, and we need to really speak out clearly and with one voice about this. Um, we need to speak about prevention. I say this in terms of, of drug treatment, there's a there's probably too much emphasis on the tertiary prevention, you know, rescuing people when they're really um, 
you know, after years of addiction, or even the the secondary trying to to um, you know find people, you know, just after they've started or after things. Have, got to the stage of dependence um by but by that stage it's very difficult to um to uh you know, to do anything uh, effective um uh, without a, a lot of input we really should be thinking more in terms of primary prevention stopping young people using in the first place and i know this is one of the key aspects of this forum today and the other thing we need to harness is the power of uh, the public, the power of families, and we need to get the ear of politicians. Um, as Abraham Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail, but against it, nothing can succeed. And perhaps we've been a little um, behind the game on this until now. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I, I've just taken you, I suppose, through a and uh, a, a whistle top tour, tour of my, my thoughts about this issue. And what I'd like to do is hand over to, um, to Emmett, who's going to take you in more detail through his study, which focuses very much on the cognitive uh, consequences of early cannabis use. And I think I'll leave it to, to Emmett to answer the questions because of the difficulties logging in. Um, but if anybody wants to email me with any thoughts um, or ask Emmett, I'm sure he'll be well able to handle the questions. And thank you so much for the invite and hopefully I can be there in person um, next time. Thank you very much. Slides anyway. So I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name's uh, oh, go back one. My name's uh, Dr. Emmett Power. I'm a clinical research fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, so uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a doctor. I finished basic specialty training in psychiatry, and then I was fortunate enough to get a, a P, I guess a PhD scholarship to uh, undergo further studies. So I'm. Uh, you could say I'm like postgraduate year seven of, I think I counted the amount of years of training I have to do. It's something going to be like 11 or 12, or like a really, really long time anyway. So this is a, a paper that we've published earlier in the year in uh, psychological medicine. And um, so we were particularly interested in looking at the effects of uh, frequent cannabis use or frequent or dependent cannabis use on IQ development in young people. And this was a meta-analysis and systematic review of longitudinal studies. I'd just like to thank everyone in the lab who, who uh, helped, um, particularly Sophie, Ashling, and Colm, um, and my second supervisor, David. Uh, so uh, this, so uh, I guess I'm on a collaborative doctoral award program, which is an interdisciplinary program. There are five of us on it. And it focuses on youth mental health and leadership, I guess. Um, so the youth mental health piece I was familiar with before, the leadership, I think that's things I come in to talk to you today uh, about uh, like a policy and this is a policy forum. And I really want to convince you, you know, that this is a young pe person's issue and that young people really need to be at the, the center of, of this policy focus. So, um, you know, cannabis use remains the most kind of common drug among people entering treatment in Ireland so for two in, every new, two, two in five every new cases. Uh, and the median age is, you know, 21 years for entering treatment, which is, you know, very young in comparison to, I guess, other drugs. Um, cannabis is, you know, highly addictive. Um, particularly for young people, young people are at much more increased risk for developing, you know, addiction to cannabis. And like, there are very clear reasons why that might be, um, such as the fact that um, in adolescence and childhood, uh, cannabinoid receptors are much more highly abundant in the brain, where they're implicated in you know, neurodevelopmental processes, as we heard earlier in um, Dr. Madras's uh, talk. So this was a combination of three different cohorts in Australia, and they found that, you know, out of uh, all the young people that smoke cannabis in adolescence, you know, one in five adolescents who had just ever used cannabis were cannabis dependent or had an addiction by age 24, and one in three were using weekly, which kind of indexes risk for later dependence. Uh, and this is just, again, from really big study, the WHO, World Mental Health Surveys, 
And what you can see is just, I guess, the rates of cannabis use through the ages. And what you can see is it's just going up and up and up. And cannabis use is the young person's problem. And what's this going to look like in the future in terms of you know, how, much young pe how, how much people in the future will be using cannabis? And you know, according to NIDA, uh, uh, using before the age of 18 increases the risk of addiction four to seven fold. Uh, and the median age of use is, is actually, you know, it's, it's at that border of between childhood and adolescence. So half of young people who start using cannabis start using cannabis as children. Um, and the incidence in some Western co countries from this, I guess, you know, WHO, World Mental Health Survey, is, is incredibly high. It's, it can be up to 40%, I think it's greater than 40%, which I think was in Israel. So, you know, cannabis and poor outcomes. So this was, I guess, one of the first academic papers that I was involved in, uh, where we looked at, I guess, a very characteristic cluster of uh, risk factors, um, you know, for, for a suicide attempt in terms of low education, mood, history of mood disorder, and um, history of adolescent cannabis use. And we found that those, you know, clusters that you know, we would typically see in, in, in our clinical work, they increase the odds of suicide attempt sevenfold. Uh, and those kind of, I guess, risk factors are often very interdependent. And why did I want to look at, you know, the cognitive outcomes from cannabis use in particular? Well, I was struck by this particular study, this classic study, I guess, that was published in Addiction, that found that, you know, people who frequently use cannabis um, were 19 times more likely not to attain a university degree. And that just seems like a huge number, uh, like really, really significant. So, and cannabis is a massive public health issue. There's probably 1.4 million people in Europe who are you know, cannabis dependent. And the rates of cannabis dependent are you know, six-fold higher in you know, the younger adult group compared to the older adult group. So, you know, well, where, where are these, you know, young people going? Uh, and another thing to just be aware of is, like, I think this is actually published in a, in a, in a, in a paper format now, I think in the last year or so, um, that, like, disrupting supply chains to young people does actually, you know, increase their academic, increase the academic performance. So this is a really interesting study that, you know, they, it was carried out, I think, in Maastricht, and basically what they wanted to do was they said, okay, we'll, we'll do an experiment to see, you know, if we disrupt the supply chain, you know, will students get better grades? So what they did is they got, uh, they grouped all this, Maastricht is like in the Netherlands, and I think it's like, so it borders loads of different places, so you get loads of different students from loads of different countries. So they sequentially restricted cannabis sales in cannabis shops, uh, to uh, young adults um, based on their nationality and then looked at like the university grades <laughs> in the local university and saw, well, you know, if, uh, you know, in the period that we restrict restricted to Dutch, German and Belgian students, did their grades improve when they couldn't access cannabis? And the answer is yes. And their dropout rates were actually slightly lower as well. So, just going on to maybe defining um, maybe what, 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 what's in the literature around, uh, um, around the cognitive effects of cannabis. So you have like acute effects, so that results from intoxication. Uh, and we heard a little, bit, a little bit earlier about, you know, with some of the new forms of cannabis, how long the acute effects can be. So you know, therefore you can say, you know, if young people are using daily in particular, well, they're, they're always having an acute effect of cannabis. Uh, residual effects, so th these are effects which, you know, depending on levels of use, may actually, you know, persist for up to 28 days. Um, that's what's in the literature. They may actually, you know, go longer than that. Some of the literature says six weeks. And the chronic effects, so chronic effects are, you know, what we're particularly interested in. And those are effects that are, you know, the long-lasting effects beyond the periods of non-acute and non-residual use. So like, is cannabis neurotoxic or does it harm your cognition in the long term? So what we know from previous like syntheses or meta-analysis or studies that group 
loads of studies together around kind of chronic effects or putative chronic effects because as you can see in the literature like definitions kind of chop and change and people can pick different cut points but just 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 to, to summarize there's been probably four four major meta-analyses in the past and th these meta-analyses have not looked at l like longitudinal cohort studies they've just looked at cross-sectional studies so that means that you can't really estimate uh, you know, what their cognition was before they started using uh, cannabis. And you can't really say anything about the trajectory. So, like, w what's the kind of value? Um, what's the major value? So, you know, as you can see, they're, they're <laughs> it's yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> so th there's not much kind of consistency, but maybe some, some small chronic effects, particularly learning and memory, tend to be recurrent features. And quite important for young people, um, given that uh, you know, they're usually in training or education. So what was the aim of our study? So well, we, we, what we want to know is, is youth onset frequent, and we defined youth as under, initially under 25, but we then refined that to under 18. Is youth onset frequent or dependent cannabis use associated with relative declines in IQ over time? Uh, we, we, we wanted only to look at, I guess, you know, cohort studies that, I guess, measured, um, measured cognition or IQ prior to the onset of cannabis use. And this is because like, cross-sectional studies can't really answer important questions about developmental trajectories. So uh, we kind of had like a PICO or POP, we asked, what's the population we're going to want to look at. We initially set a mean of less than 25 years, but actually everyone we included in the study had onset of cannabis use prior to the age of 18. So we defined this as we wanted to capture whether the effects of cannabis might have a neurotoxic effect on development. Or, um, we restricted it to those who had a baseline IQ score of greater than 70, so we, we didn't include people with intellectual disability. And we wanted them to have no cannabis use at baseline or just have very little cannabis use at baseline. I'll explain about that in a while. And we wanted them to be community samples or kind of largely representative of people in the community. We weren't going after, we didn't want necessarily to, to, to sample people who might have been attending clinics or who might have been attending health services because generally people who attend health services have you know, more severe problems and they're just not representative of you know, your average 18, 17 year old walking down the street. And I guess that's what we wanted to, to find out. You know, is there an effect on IQ development? The average 18 year old walking down the street or you know, any wooden son, mother, or child. Um, so the exposures that we defined, so actually we said pretty, we wanted to capture like you know, what cannabis use looks like in the community. So we defined it as like one joint a week for uh, like one, one joint or more a week for, you know, at, uh, at least six months, uh, or 25 lifetime exposures, or that they had some sort of cannabis use problem. So it really was quite a broad, uh, like a, a really broad um, sample and broad mixture of of cannabis problems, but I would, what I would say is that like this actually varied from study to study in terms of um, with the mixture of cannabis problems. And I guess some studies in the past, you know, have not used these thresholds or, or cutoff points. And we did actually contact the authors, and we actually got the data from some studies, reanalyzed it using, I guess, the author's own analysis, but just uh, using this exposure rather than maybe the exposure that they have defined in the study that crossed over some of these points. So we asked, we wanted to ask a consistent question because consistency wasn't always a feature of measuring exposures in the longitudinal literature. And the control, uh, so we wanted to, um, so we wanted, so we, we did include people with less than five lifetime uses in the control group. And this is because adolescents who report like, um, you know, experimental use, it's, it's often quite inconsistent. So some studies have been done in Northern Ireland 
looking at the consistency of like lifetime experimental reporting of cannabis use in adolescents and that it, it can be quite inconsistent. And the outcome, so, um, so we wanted the studies to be included that only had longitudinal design, uh, that we measured their you know, IQ, that their IQ is measured prior to the cannabis exposure, and then after um, the, the exposure also. And we wanted to allow at least two years uh, interval between, their, I guess, their wave one measurement and the wave two measurement. And then, you know, we followed like the guidelines around how best to do this type of study. So, um, one of my colleagues, uh, I screened all the abstracts, and then one of my colleagues screened all the abstracts. And then, if there were any disagreements, we, um, you know, had to agree that they met like certain predefined inclusion or exclusion criteria. Um, and we pre-registered our analysis as well, although. So we, we decided what we were going to do before we did it. We didn't just like look at the results and say, oh, I've changed this to suit myself, you know. But we did change something. Uh, so we said we were going to look at each individual subcategory of IQ, but we didn't do that in the end. We just looked at um, full-scale IQ, verbal, and nonverbal. But you can break that down into, I guess, more subcategories. Um, and, ag and again, just around, you know, if, if, it did, if there was data that existed that we felt, you know, could fit our kind of question, we, we just made that happen. Um, so we, we also, we contacted like a, you know, a, an information specialist um, uh, and developed like the search strategy because, um, you know, we wanted to just to make sure that we got every study possible uh, in, in the, in, in the meta-analysis. Um, so initially, I think there was like 5,815 uh, abstracts, and then so after the duplicates, I think there was 2,878. So we screened that amount of uh, abstracts, and then found 33 articles that you know we thought you know this could answer the question. But in the end, we actually only found seven studies. So I guess only seven studies have looked at you know the before the onset of cannabis use and after the onset of cannabis use and what happens to the trajectory. And these are the seven studies. Um, so as you can see, they, they tended to vary in size. Um, I think, you know, so they're from a mixture of different countries, mainly kind of West, weird countries, really, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, so in, as you can see, there's, there's more controls, but I think there was about 500 or 600, or six, six, 700 or so um, people with who we defined as having frequent or, uh, you know, frequent cannabis use. So I guess we have significant, like, statistical power even to discover, like, modest effects or smaller effects. And then again, the ages, so, like, just, just looking at the ages, like 17, 18, 17, 15, 18, one of 38, Dr. Meyer presented that uh, paper already, actually, uh, and then 17 again. And this, you, this, you can see the effect sizes. So, like, all the effects are negative, as you kind of expect. Um, and, you know, there's one study that, you know, has moderate effects. And the rest seem to all be quite small effects. So this is just going into like the, the various different study characteristics. So as you can see, like the, the measures that were used, they're all well-validated measures. Um, they vary in, in, in some characteristics in terms of like um, in study two and three, they were um, composite indexes. So they just used four of the subtests of the IQ, but that's validated to give like at a group level um, a fairly reliable result. Um, so, um, you know, the cannabis use level varied between studies as well. You know, in one study it was just greater than 50 lifetime uses, and other studies it was dependence. Then in other studies we kind of had refit multiple categories, um, you know, to fit our question. And I guess this is where it kind of can differ a little bit because um, 
I guess, studies tended to control for, 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 different, uh, for di different things. I just like highlight that maybe one study controlled for loads and loads and loads of factors, uh, even though they only had, I think, 79 people in their cannabis using group, um, which may be a bit problematic in terms of multicollinearity. And I guess these are the results. Um, so as you can see, you know, there, there is a decline in IQ you know, by, by the age of, of 17, 18. Uh, that's driven by a decline in like, verbal IQ, and that really goes with a lot of the literature around how verbal learning and verbal memory are impaired in cannabis use. A lot of the cross, previous cross-sectional studies, that tends to be the most um, you know, consistent finding in the literature. And as you can see, performance IQ, uh, it, you know, there's no change in performance IQ by age 17. Um, so we, we did actually kind of, uh, we did a sensitivity analysis. So we wanted to see, you know, is this just like one, is there one study driving this effect? So we did like a leave one out analysis. So we reran sequentially the meta-analysis, leaving one study out of, of each, it's in the supplement to the paper, but like you, you definitely don't want to see that all the all the tables and like no one study um, you know influenced any of the results. And as you can see, like the so the I squared is 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 pretty low. What the I squared means is that means like how homogeneous homogeneous or heterogeneous is the data. And as you can see, it's pretty homogeneous, uh, and that usually means you know we're asking a pretty refined question. And so we used, uh, we, we wanted to like see what was the quality of the studies that we included. So we used a scale called the Newcastle Ottawa scale. Again, we, you know, I did it and then a colleague of mine uh, rated the studies and I think our, our, our ratings were I think 96%, you know, the same. Uh, so what you can see again is that like, you know, study retention is one thing that we might talk about. Uh, at a later slide, you know, study retention tended to be a little bit variable, and it, it was quite low in some studies. Like, so in one study in particular, I think that there was only like a very in the teens in terms of the amount of follow-up. And if you think of like why people might be missing from a study and what we know from cohort studies, you know, uh, young people who use drugs tend to drop out of cohort studies and not be followed up, and that might you know affect how. You know, we ask questions and interpret data from, from longitudinal studies about substance use in young people. But overall, like, the, 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 the quality w was okay. So it met about, you know, 80% of the quality indicators. And then, you know, uh, publication bias as well. So, like, are these findings just because no one has published the positive studies about cannabis? And, like, well, we did a statistical analysis called the Vivian Hedges weight function model, and like, no, the answer is no. Okay, <laughs> so this isn't due to the the, the bad results being cherry picked by you know journal editors into like the published literature. Uh, just another thing as well, like we wanted to see, you know, was was there like baseline differences in in, in IQ between young people who go on to use cannabis frequently versus those who don't. And the answer is no, there, there's not, um, based on what's available in the literature and what information we know about. It. So we, we did look at, you know, is there baseline differences in verbal versus performance IQ? Um, there were some tiny, tiny differences in performance IQ um, at baseline, but remember, that's not the one that changes after you use cannabis. Um, so this is, I guess, the first meta-analysis of longitudinal data to show that frequent cannabis use in youth has an adverse effect on IQ over time. Um, most previous studies were probably underpowered to find an overall effect at this level, you know, given that um, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the people included in the cannabis using group mightn't have been like the huge, huge users that, uh, that we might see, you know, that might have problematic cannabis use. That, they just have like recreational use, you would say, you know. Um, but some people included in the cannabis using group would have had problematic cannabis use, um, but they would have been a small minority overall. Novel, as we kind of, we wanted to look at pre-exposure baseline in terms of summarizing the results. Uh, all the subjects had onset of frequent or dependent cannabis use prior to the age of 18. Um, 
So just a few kind of discussion points. You know, do, do we have good enough data around this question yet? You know, I'd say the answer is no. Um, you know, we could always have better studies, particularly with better retention rates and specific strategies to retain young people who, who use drugs in research studies so we can find out more about how their drug use affects them. Um, and we probably need specific strategies to do that, um, just going beyond kind of the usual strat strategies. Because I guess if young people who use drugs are missing from longitudinal studies, um, not at random, or missing this not at random, then we don't actually know anything about how their drug use affects them. Um, and it's improbable to say there is no causal effect. You know, crystallized or verbal intelligence, intelligence is known to be affected by education up until late adolescence. Um, we, we know from like twin studies that you know, there is a causal impact of cannabis use on education, therefore, why would there not be a causal impact of cannabis use on, on, on IQ, at least through like a sort of you know, social, a biosocial pathway? Um, so that's how I would interpret that data anyway. Um, another issue, I guess, is that you know, um, when you measure cannabis use by self-report, that's like incredibly noisy data because you don't know exactly what they're using in terms of like recall bias. Um, you know, we don't know that much about, but we know that uh, you know um, social desirability biases play a role in how young people might report their their cannabis use. Um, and again, like things around method method of ingestion that can affect how much cannabis use uh, is actually you know absorbed. So, like for instance, if you smoke cannabis uh, with tobacco versus without tobacco, well, you actually absorb more cannabis with tobacco, but yet often in studies we also adjust for, can for, for tobacco use, uh, which seems counterintuitive. Um, and also, you know, we, all, we found a, a modest effect in this age group, so it was about three verbal IQ points, but like, you know, going back to like Swedish constructs again, I, I know, Professor James McCabe in KCL, one of his studies from a good few years ago now, again looked at Swedish conscripts who later developed schizophrenia, and you know what happened to their, I guess, cognitive status between the ages of 13 and 17, and really they had a, an analogous uh, verbal IQ decline to the cannabis using group that uh, we, we've seen here. Um, so I think that's, that's important to say as well. So just because the effect is small doesn't mean it's consequential for, for later outcomes. So, you know, what are the two potential mechanisms? So there's definitely, a, you know, a biosocial pathway. You know, there's really good evidence for that, that, you know, at least repeated acute effects and residual effects reduce educational attainment and that does like, you know, re reduce your ability to score and like a vocabulary test that is present in you know, IQ, IQ tests. Um, and then there's the neurotoxicity altered development uh, pathway. And that's probably the pathway that we don't have as much information on, um, really apart from, uh, I guess, Dr. Meyer's work, which has been you know, really um, impactful in terms of the quality of the data, the quality of the cohort study, and the size of the effects seen in that study. Um, however, there has been some recent work from the imaging cohort, and I imagine there'll be some you know, ongoing work again from ABCD. Oh, I guess this study was published in JAMA Psychiatry only recently, it's from uh, Dr. Hugh Garavan's group. And I guess what they found was they found accelerated cortical thinning, I guess in areas that you would be known to be associated with high, high abundance of CB1 receptors in adolescents. So uh, the take homes are that, you know, there's really like multiple levels of evidence around cannabis use and, and later outcomes. And I guess we, we need to like appreciate, be, be a bit gestalt about it and appreciate the, the whole body of evidence rather than just focusing on like specific studies that, you know, uh, I guess, you know, look at that, that suit our biases. And like, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the second talk earlier on today. Um, we need to be conscious that you know when we're looking at longitudinal studies, 
um, you know, our, in terms of our effect sizes, we have to be, at least we can't prove that young people who use cannabis might be missing not at random from these studies, but it's, it's very highly plausible. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's hard to get young people who you know, have really problematic cannabis use to come to treatment, it is going to be get hard. It's, it's going to be very hard to get them to come to research studies. You know, um, uh, the reliability of measures is another issue. And you know, thinking about like if I was planning a study in the future, I would definitely want some uh, biological measures as well. Um, and again, just to comment on like some of the twin studies, um, they have quite low power and low numbers. Um, and they can't detect small effect sizes uh, reliably, and have to be aware that there, there is non-shared environmental confounders, and that the underlying assumptions in twin studies tend to overestimate heritable effects. And I guess, you know, what, what there is a lack of in terms of uh, cannabis use in the academic literature is looking at within-person effects. So I guess within-person effects, like, uh, it's where you have a fixed effect within the person over time. So we look at between, between, between group differences, generally, in, in this research question. And I guess between, between, between group differences, are, uh, they can be problematic sometimes. And you can get, I guess, more heterogeneous findings across the literature. And, and that's because you, get, you can have omitted variable bias. As in, I'll give you an analogy. So, um, you know, you water your plants every day, but it, it rains sometimes during the summer. How do you know uh, what major plants grow or die? Um, whereas, if we look at within-person effects, um, you know, a person is serving as their own control. And, but in order for that to happen, we need to have panel data over time where people's cannabis use changes so we can compare the outcomes within the person um, when they're exposed versus not exposed to the, to the, to the problematic toxin. You know? um, but in order to do that, you know, you'd need to have panel studies or cohort studies that you know, A, can manage to retain lots of young people in them who use cannabis use, and B, uh, retain uh, and be that young people's cannabis use must, must change you know, within research studies and hopefully reduce. Um, oh, no. I think that's my last slide. And the implications for young people. So, you know, cannabis use is bad, it needs to be minimized, it's a public health problem, we have big alcohol, big tobacco, do we need big cannabis? And uh, you know, there's evidence of specific vulnerability in young people. They really need to be a priority uh, compared to adults. Thank you. Thank you. And, oh yeah. So if you're interested in uh, that as well, so we have a, our group has a series of talks running. But uh, any any questions? There were some online questions. Oh, great. Okay. So we had an online question from Lena and Madeline from both. They were wondering if there's any differences in genders in the results you have been analyzing. Uh, so we, we didn't look at gender. Um, I guess there are some differences in outcomes. Uh, so I guess in terms of psychosis that I know of, so there is, a, there is a literature around the fact that the age of onset of psychosis equalizes in males compared to females when there's a prior exposure to cannabis, whereas the age of onset in schizophrenia generally without, that's not associated with cannabis, is generally a good bit later. Um, so that's, that, that's the, the gender associations that I know of, but that's a really interesting question and I'm actually looking at it in another study. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's good to include it in the next study. Another question would be, how can we communicate the consequences of cannabis, which is such as a reduction of IQ, to young people who do not see themselves as addicts and to make them advocate for the effects instead? Well, I mean, that's really hard. I think, uh, I think you need to take um, a kind of a compassionate approach. Um, because uh, young people who use drugs have like loads of problems, usually have like loads of different problems in life and um, really taking, you know, using evidence-based therapies, but, you know, being, being compassionate is uh, really important. 
uh, I, I think what's, you know, I guess in, in Ireland and in terms of like, you know, what, how our health research board, you know, funds new health projects, particularly with the patient focus, what, what, they, what they want in every project now is a public patient uh, involvement, uh, like, bit. So every time you go for research grant funding now, you, you must have, like, public patient involvement. Um, so that would be, you know, getting people who, who get, getting young people involved in research, you know, particularly around interventions and stuff like that, um, you know, who've been through the mill of it and come out the other side, you know, um, you know, perhaps they're the people that uh, have the answers. Definitely. Any other questions from the audience here? No? Then I will do one more online question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it might be a little bit off your topic, but still it relates to because the um, cannabis has such a long longitudinal effect, but how can, how to increase the safety of infants against drug-affected parents? Oh, um, that's a, it's a really kind of pertinent question, um, how to affect no, infants. Uh, so, uh, is there, uh, mm -hmm. so infants, generally, so I would have no experience with kind of infants, but I know, um, I know our, um, our, uh, so our child and family agency, they're called TUSLA, uh, they've developed like, I think they've developed guidelines around parents and uh, drug use. Um, and it, it generally, and like it, it, in Ireland, it is becoming more of a phenomenon or young, young women with problems, with problems with drug use is becoming more of a phenomenon or something that's maybe not more of a phenomenon, but something that's been, been recognized by their agency as uh, being important. But uh, I guess I, I don't have a social work background, so um, that's something I would usually ask a social worker. Sorry. <laughs> no problem, that's okay. Um, one last question as well, and then we will, I will thank you very much and we go to the break. But how to avoid the dropout of people? As you mentioned, there is this risk of people dropping out. How to avoid it in future, future longitudinal studies? Uh, whew, I don't know. Um, so the dropout in longitudinal studies tends to vary, and I think generally the more money you spend, the better um, retention you get and the more people feel invested in the research questions. So I guess that's one of the reasons why the HRB, at our Health Research Board in Ireland is, I guess, particularly pushing PPI is they want the, the quality and the investment of people participating in the research to increase, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again for, for you and also for Mary who has been joining us online for this very interesting reflection on uh, several studies basically what we have continuing on what we were uh, talking about before with Madeleine on the effects of cannabis on a longer term in the cognitive field behavior and also that again as said before that the social development is also being affected by it um, and work etc and that yeah, it still has to be done a lot of research, yet there is a lot of research already existing, but I guess more the even longer uh, longitudinal studies will be very effective for the future. So thank you again, um, big applause. <laughs>